Hi, uh, welcome to Seizing Opportunities in the ETF Marketplace. Uh, so I thought we'd start just real briefly, uh, introduce ourselves. Again, I'm uh, Bib Strench. I'm a partner at Thompson Hine in our investment management practice. I'm in D.C. And I've been following e uh, ETFs literally from the beginning because I was at the staff uh, when the first ETF, uh, Super Trust, was birthed into this world. Um, it didn't have a, um, a long shelf life, but anyway, I've, I've had a real interest in this area, and as, as we'll talk about later, it's, it's obviously uh, grown tremendously. Um, to my left is John. Do you want to say a few words, John? Sure. Uh, John Jacobs, and uh, I have a long history of ETFs as well, not quite as long as did, but I started working on QQQ in 1998. Currently at Georgetown at the Center for Financial Markets and Policy, and uh, but prior to that I was at the, the NASDAQ, uh, NASDAQ for 32 years. Uh, hi everybody, this is Richard Keery uh, with Global ETF Advisors. Uh, I'm an independent consultant uh, within the ETF industry, um, helping my clients uh, bring new products and innovative products to the marketplace. Uh, I am also a former uh, NASDAQ employee where I ran the uh, NASDAQ's ETF listings business. And uh, in a lifetime prior to that, I was uh, an equity trader at some of the bulge bracket desks uh, on Wall Street. And, uh, and thank you all for, uh, for joining and participating with us today. Uh, we appreciate your, uh, your interest in this topic. Okay, so we're going to cover a variety of topics like I uh, mentioned before. And, um, and we're going to lead off uh, with a discussion uh, from John about, as the title suggests, the global ETF, ETP landscape. Go ahead, John. Great. Yeah, I think uh, one of the ways to figure out where we're going is to uh, understand exactly where we are. And um, so let's talk a little bit about where we are today as an industry. Um, and I'm using the numbers from ETF GI from the end of the third quarter, 2016. So global ETF ETP AUM reached 3.4 trillion. That was a new record. And it also marked 32 months of consecutive AUM inflow. The number of products hit 6,526 globally as the end of the quarter, and those products had twice as many listings. Focused in the U.S. alone, we hit a asset level of $2.4 trillion. There's still a tremendous pipeline of new offerings, as we know and uh, new listings still coming to market. So it's very robust. From those measures, this ETP, ETF marketplace that we're in is still extremely robust. Uh, on, let's flip to active for a moment, just to keep it in perspective. So active and non-transparent products hit 40 billion at the end of the third quarter in AUM. Number of products hit 293. But again, both those number of products and AUM are very tiny in percentage compared to the overall size of the marketplace. There are only nine active products with AUM of over $1 billion. So a couple of things to think about this. So again, we've seen the record growth of the industry continue, and, uh, and, and, and we continue to see the uh, massive inflows and new product launches. However, let's keep in mind that 70% of the global AUM is in the U.S. That 1% of these products have garnered 13% of the inflows for the first three quarters of 2016. The top 20 products accounted for 66% of the total volume, and ETF volume is driving exchange volume in general, and only 1% of these products had an average daily volume of over a million shares. So that leads us to look at this industry in a couple different ways. One, there's concentration risk. This is a, an industry dominated by large players from every part, every role, from sponsor to platform to index provider to listing market. But concentration always leads to opportunity, which is what we're going to talk about today. Concentration leads to opportunity. Big players tend to lose the, um, I'm not sure I want to say the ability, but ten, large players tend not to be as innovative as the smaller players. And we see that throughout business, throughout history, throughout um, uh, any, any industry you want to look at. So some of the other things we want to talk about and some of the other opportunities are defined contribution plans, public pensions, the solving the problem of the illiquid constituents and how to create liquid products around illiquid constituent products. And what does it mean for the fee compression? Again, the large players being able to, to drive fee compression for new products, new platforms, uh, and opportunities are, uh, uh, there. 
so I think that's the kind of the big picture background we wanted to lay out there and, uh, and kind of just set the tone for today. Uh, thanks, John. Um, one of the um, recent uh, regulations in, in Washington that's been garnering a lot of attention is the Department of Labor F fiduciary rule. Uh, it's impacting um, lots of industries uh, and uh, ETFs. Now, uh, you, you may have been reading in, in the press, a lot of people are wondering uh, how um, how they should react now that we're going to have a new president in and um, is that going to be the uh, end of the DLL fiduciary rule. Um, I, unscientifically, I think most people may have slowed their response, but they're still uh, assuming that uh, the rule with all its features will go forward. Um, now, once uh, Donald Trump becomes president, uh, he uh, there's uh, several options he would have um, to uh, either slow down the rule or actually eliminate the rule. Um, you know, he's going to appoint the secretary. Um, there's currently litigation uh, going on against the rule, and the uh, the government could uh, concede on that litigation. Uh, a big part of the rule, which I'll talk about in a, in a second, is enforcement in the fear of of, of labor enforcing things, and, and obviously they could, uh, uh, the new administration could set a lax enforcement area, or or Congress uh, could pass legislation um, to override the rule. So, um, you know, it's unclear, like a lot of things, obviously, what's going to happen with the fiduciary rule, but it's it's really um, uh, been kind of a catalyst or. Uh, and another accelerant in a, uh, a trend with respect to uh, retirement plans and IRAs uh, for there to be um, you know, more uh, focus on uh, an ad advisor's fiduciary duty. And uh, one of those uh, focuses, obviously, as, as John just mentioned, um, is fee compression. Um, and, and so with respect to ETFs, um, you know, the, the first obvious thing is it's a lower cost product uh, than mutual funds, so a lot of people think that's going to uh, provide some uh, tailwind uh, for ETFs and there'll be a benefit if there's a migration out of mutual fund assets. Um, but, um, you know, basically what we're talking about are uh, 401k uh, retirement type accounts as well as IRAs. And as you probably know, the uh, fiduciary rule is addressing a conflict of interest with a real focus on uh, compensation schemes and whether uh, the, a person who meets the definition of advisor uh, can receive a commission uh, versus receiving a flat fee. Um, and, and so, you know, there directly the ETF provider uh, is, is you know, unless it has a sales force, it's typically not going to be directly impacted. Rather, it's going to be um, impacted more when these advisors are uh, advising a plan or persons with IRAs on what products they can use. And in that case, um, fee is going to be um, a big argument for them to say that they're fulfilling their fiduciary duty if they pick a, a lower uh, cost a uh, product versus another. Um, you know, within the ETF world, of course, um, there, there, you know, there, that may be uh, suggestions that ETFs that are trying to track the same uh, index and one's from a lower cost provider versus another one from a, a higher fee ETF, um, you know, there could be some potential friction there. Uh, in choosing uh, or reluctance by the advisor in choosing the higher fee uh, ETF. Um, the, the, the last thing I'll mention um, is that, well, this is not going to go away. If they repeal the fiduciary rule, uh, there's still uh, prohibitive transactions, parts of ERISA. There's still fiduciary concerns. And I think with respect to the ETF, um, it's been a slower um, migration to ETFs in general because, number one, they're viewed still, since they trade on an exchange, 
as a shorter term product and, and, and mutual funds uh, are kind of a, a better fit in some people's view because it's a longer term uh, type of an investment. So having NAV during the day or having a share price during the day is not as critical. Um, and then the, the technology is still lagging on most of these platforms are geared for uh, mutual funds with an NAV computed at the end of the day versus um, a, a trying to uh, download and bring down information on, um, on, on prices throughout the day. So I don't think all the technology hurdles uh, have been uh, crossed yet. So um, with that said about the uh, fiduciary rule, I think we're going to move on uh, to you, Rich, and, and talk a little bit about kind of the operations. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, so one of the trends that we're seeing to dovetail on some of the stuff that John was saying and, 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 and also Bib um, is with the growth that we're seeing in ETFs and with uh, additional inertia coming from the regulatory side, there is a real push from your traditional uh, asset managers, mutual fund providers who are looking and been looking at the ETF space for quite a while and thinking that you know, they have to get into it. Um, in my own business, I'm having more and more of these conversations with these types of clients. Um, there's a couple of general sort of misconceptions that uh, an active managed shop is going to have around how do you run an ETF business uh, and what does that entail. So the, the two things on this slide is, is sort of the, the, the two biggest areas, right? So the, the, the custody and accounting side uh, on managing ETF, which is really the differentiator there, obviously, is the creation redemption process in an ETF. Um, if you're a mutual fund shop, you may be lucky enough that your current uh, custody provider um, has an ETF group uh, that can help you, but it will be a different ETF group. You're going to have to interact with them differently. You're going to have uh, different situations um, and processes that you're going to have to put in place. So it's not a it's not a simple plug and play that hey I can run my ETF the way I run my mutual fund. It's going to be run completely differently, uh, and you're going to have to be uh, prepared uh, for that. Um, some of the back office technology is different as well in terms of what you need to send out to your providers um, in order to keep your your funds uh, up and running. Uh, the other biggest sort of cultural change um, is having to deal with the capital markets. This is something a mutual fund complex has never had to deal with before. Uh, bid ask spreads, uh, market makers, a, a lead market maker, an approved participant. Uh, you know who are all these players and how do they affect my funds and my growth of my funds? Um, and they all have significant significant roles. So you're going to need dedicated staff to be able to handle this. So what we've seen in the marketplace is sort of a couple of different ways of handling this. Um, the, the first is acquisition. Uh, we've seen a lot of players, uh, mutual fund players, come in and acquire uh, ETF people. And a lot of that is for the knowledge uh, of how to run an ETF and, and to have that sort of separate group already custom built uh, to run. Two large examples of the benefits of that, you can go back to uh, PowerShares and, and iShares. All right? So when BlackRock went out, which is a traditional active shop, buys a passive shop, an ETF shop, and iShares, uh, and the first thing that happened was they were immediately accretive to earnings for BlackRock and are now the biggest driver uh, for BlackRock's earnings and their revenue. So as a mutual fund company, an actively managed shop, feeling the stress and the pressure from, from you know, these, these new products coming out of the marketplace, uh, by joining forces with them and having an active and passive product to provide to your clients, um, you're, you're, you're getting significant growth from the passive side and the ETF side of this business. Um, to expand your revenue base. And the same exact thing happened to PowerShares uh, with their parent company, Invesco. Um, and both Invesco and BlackRock are publicly traded companies. So when you see their earnings reports come out, you can see exactly the, the impact uh, that having an ETF shop uh, associated with your active shop um, has had on your, on your bottom line for your shareholders. Um, if we uh, flip over to, uh, to the next slide, um, one of the other things in sort of running this new ETF business, whether it's a standalone uh, business or that you've acquired or if you're going to build it organically internally, is that, uh, you know, are you going to build an index or are you going to run it actively managed? Uh, and I'm going to make one, one sort of personal comment on the actively managed side. 
one of the things that we hear all the time why active managers don't want to get into the active ETF space is that they don't want to divulge their portfolio. All right, so they're going to have to divulge their portfolio at 4 o'clock every day. One of the reasons they don't want to do this is they're concerned about front running. Um, I would argue that is much less of an issue today uh, than it has been uh, in past years. Um, to sort of categorize that a little bit, if you, if you go back 10 years ago when there was still um, action down on the floor of the, of, the, of the stock exchanges and stock exchanges were floor based, um, those floors were originally designed to be the epicenter of information. If you wanted information on the, what was going on in the stock market, you had to get it from the floor of the exchange. I was an upstairs trader back when I was trading. I was trading NASDAQ stocks. But if I was trading you know, Intel and I wanted to see what was going on in, you know, in Hewlett Packard or IBM on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, I had to call down to the floor and say, give me a look at IBM or give me a look at HP. That's where the information was. And the people on the floor were getting that information before anybody else, and therefore were being able to front run. And there was a front running issue back on floor based exchanges. Now that everything has become electronic, and institutions are trading in retail size order flow, where they're putting out 1,000 share orders and 500 share orders, and you don't know if that short order represents a million or five million shares behind it, it's almost impossible now to front run these orders. Um, so even divulging that you're beginning to, to create a new position in a new stock, um, you're not going to have a lot of impact on those individual stocks um, unless they're very, very thinly traded. Um, so I would argue against front running being a major issue to prevent people from running actively managed ETFs. Um, there may be a few others more, more likely so is, um, you know, are you, you running against your portfolio managers who have built your business? Um, so that's a, that's the thing you're going to have to run into. Um, uh, and that's on your active strategies. Running a passive strategy, um, there's a couple different ways. Obviously, you can license an existing index um, off the shelf. A lot of people like doing that, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this later. Um, but that becomes really a branding issue and a cost issue. Do I want to pay that money for an indexer's brand? Does that index or brand mean anything? Um, that that's a decision that you know you'd have to make internally. Um, again, I would argue that the index's brand might not be as important as it once was uh, because what's selling ETFs today is performance and price. And I think in the earlier stages of ETF uh, business, brand was selling ETFs. It's an iShares and an S&P product. I trust it. Um, investors are now much more sophisticated about ETFs and that performance and price is driving um, the purchases of ETFs. Um, there are various types of um, exemptive relief. So self-indexing is a possibility for new entrances where you don't need the brand. Um, you can hire a third-party uh, indexer to help you create an index, not use the brand, not pay for the brand, reduce your cost of your, of your fund, um, and get that out and running. And there's a number of providers in the marketplace that can help you with that. Um, the other issue in, in running your, your business is you're trading your portfolio differently. Uh, in an ETF than you would in an actively managed. There's got to be some expertise. A lot of active managed shops already outsource their portfolio management uh, business. That's got to continue to be done. Um, there's compliance and, and other issues uh, where you're going to need the ETF uh, experience of these, of these uh, third party providers and have them on their partnership model because the, the concept there is once again, these folks are your ETF experts. You need to bring them in-house more as a partner, not as a vendor, um, and think of them because they're are the ones that are going to be driving the, uh, the structure of your product and the growth of your product over time. Um, and you have to look at them a little differently and, and, and look at your business as a partnership model. When you run an ETF, because there are so many different people um, that you need to run an ETF, then you have to look at your ETF business as a partnership model. Uh, that everybody is involved and has a stake in the growth of that ETF. Um, and you have to recognize that as you're building out that business model. Yeah, and one thing I would add, Rich, to, um, you know, one, uh, one thing nice about starting the ETF is you can outsource uh, a lot of these functions. In most cases, they have to be outsourced to various vendors, and there's wonderful vendors out there. But um, quickly, after it, it launches, uh, you have uh, you may have issues, and so it's 
really critical that somebody at the ETF and at the advisor uh, knows about all those uh, processes. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, if something happens, like a, a trading halt, uh, they're going to look to the uh, ETF advisor and provider to issue a press release, and they're going to have to issue that you know pretty fast. And if somebody doesn't have the rudimentary understanding of how a market works or uh, how the create redeem process works, um, you know, in that situation. Um, it, it, it's not going to be uh, pretty. So I think uh, there is a learning curve, and a lot of focus is everything can be outsourced, uh, but internally uh, somebody needs to have uh, a good understanding of all those processes that are uh, outsourced. In including having a good counsel like them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, the next slide is uh, another way of running your, your ETF business is to completely outsource the entire process. Um, so the, these these businesses has popped up where you can call white label, third party platforms, uh, whatever you want to call them. But basically what they're doing is they're leasing out all of their operational functionality to you uh, or you're leasing it to the, from them so you don't have to ever worry about it. Um, if you, and what we're seeing is a lot of those clients are uh, asset managers who really only know how to sell the strategy. They don't know how to operate it. Um, so rather than trying to piece together uh, that process, they lease that entire process out uh, or outsource the entire process, uh, go about their business that they know what to do best and leave it to the ETS experts to do what they know best. Um, some of these platforms have been successful. Um, so the funds that have been on these platforms have been successful. Some haven't been. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but there are roles that can be played. Um, the, the most important one is the advisor. The advisor is the one who owns the exemptive relief order that you're, that you're leasing. They have the regulatory responsibility. I think they may be getting to some of this a little later on. Uh, but you can play various roles um, within this third-party platform, either as a sponsor, as a sub-advisor, or even as an indexer, in order to launch your idea and bring your idea to marketplace. Uh, it's what we were talking about again earlier about being um, uh, creative and, and bringing new innovative products to the marketplace and, and entrepreneurs being able to come to the marketplace uh, and fight against the big guys uh, where they don't have to compete against the big guys. They can bring out innovative products uh, that they, they feel is a need in the marketplace that they can fill and, and these third-party platforms give them an ability to come to market and to play in the playground with the bigger guys. Um, as I like to say, the, the ETF industry is very democratic in that way. Um, the barrier to entry currently is fairly low. We'll see in the next slide there, there are some significant costs, um, but they're not dramatic. So, uh, so you can get into this industry. You can launch a product, um, and now it's a matter of, you know, what do I need to be successful in doing that? Um, so one of the reasons why people need to use the platforms, obviously, is at least the exempt of order. They can come to market within 90 days, so your speed to market is, is extraordinary. And it gives you operational efficiency. You've outsourced the entire process. Um, that's done. You don't have to worry about it. It's protected. It's regulated. You just go about selling your, your strategy and pushing your strategy out to investors to grow your farm. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a very effective way of getting the, um, the process through. Um, so uh, we received a question, I guess, it's, that's, that's uh, along this topic line. So uh, I'll answer it real, real quickly uh, from, from Robert Rowe. It says, you know, does the performance have any impact in the decision process rather than the price? Um, the, the performance, I'm assuming, uh, the performance of the fund um, impact decision process rather than the price. So the, uh, I'm not quite sure what's being, was being asked. Are you tracking? Um, so the, the tracking error? Oh. Um, does the performance have an impact in the decision process rather than the price? Yeah, if you can resubmit that for us, Robert, so I can get a better understanding of exactly what you're, you're, you're trying to get to, uh, we would be happy to, to, to answer it. Um, the the uh, decision process in terms of launching a product, um, there's the performance versus the price. Uh, always performance is what investors are going to be looking for. Um, 
uh, rather than the price. They can they can overcome pricing issues if they're getting performance issue, um, if it fills a, a need that they have in their portfolio. Uh, so if that's what you were looking for, that I think that would be the short answer on that. Uh, happy to elaborate more uh, more details from you. Um, going back to the slide real quick, like I mentioned, the the operational efficiency of uh, of not having to worry about the the operational side, so you can run your own business and selling your product. Uh, and bringing innovative product is is important. Um, the next slide uh, will give you a real quick summary here of the cost of what that looks like for people who are looking for it. Um, these are estimates. Different providers will have different costs for different reasons. Uh, but you're looking at setup fees. You're looking at annual fees there of you know 200, 275 thousand dollars depending on your strategy and the platform that you're using. Um, that's assuming zero uh, assets. So the fund isn't producing any assets. You not have you don't have any management fee revenue. Uh, that would be your total all-in costs. As soon as you start raising assets and collecting a management fee, those management fees would offset these costs. Of course, if you uh, raise more money than your those fees, you you start to make money. Um, the average break-even point for these products is usually around forty-five million dollars. If you're doing a sixty-five basis point product. Um, there's fee compression we talk about, uh, smart beta, unique products can push your uh, management fee higher towards the 65 basis points. Uh, if you have a broad market based uh, product you want to bring to market, you're going to be competing in that world with the big guys, you're not going to be able to compete. The cost to bring out a product isn't there. Um, so you need to play on the fringes with innovative products where you can demand a higher management fee because your IP is superior. To what's in the marketplace, and uh, and there you, where you demand that sort of management fee. Uh, so if you can run a product that way, you're looking at 45, 50 million as in AUM as your break-even point. Um, success stories that we see, there's various reasons um, uh, why there is success. Um, the platform business is just like the ETF business itself that John mentioned earlier. Uh, a few big funds dominate. Most funds don't have the the AUM yet. They're also very young funds because these platforms have only been around for a few years, so their track record isn't there yet. Uh, so you can't get a real read on them just as of yet. Uh, two of the biggest reasons for success, one would be seed capital. Can you bring a fund to market where you're getting seed capital either from your existing business, uh, from investors who uh, are going to come into the fund in, in early stages that you know about who want to use the fund? Uh, other things that we have seen is in the conversion space, mostly from SMAs, where people are converting SMAs into ETFs and you're launching an ETF at 50, 100, 200 million dollars. You've already exceeded your break-even point. You're into the market ahead of the game. Um, those funds tend to be very successful. Uh, you're also hitting a bogey for getting on the um, wirehouse platforms once you get to 25, 50 billion, uh, million in uh, AUM. Uh, so those are important things to think about, and we will talk about distribution later on. I think this is a, a great, interesting point. To point out. This is a clear evolution of this industry. When the first ETFs were launched, seed capital came from the specialist firms, because all these products were from the MS, and the specialist firms who had a monopoly in trading and could make, certainly make all the money back trading, making great trading profits, um, were the ones who provided seed capital. And that Obviously, with market structure changes over time, that has completely changed. They are no longer the source of seed capital. And as Rich mentioned, there's a variety of other ways to do it. But the, the, the key is, it's no longer good enough to have a good idea. You have to have a good idea that has money behind it. You have to have someone who's willing to commit capital at the get-go, from the very beginning to this product, in order to, um, for all the reasons we talked about, um, describe shelf space and platforms and everything else, uh, you need to have, uh, have access to seed capital. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. And I, I think is when I have clients coming out to platforms, and the, it's kind of funny. I I'd have to tell you over the last few years, I probably um, did a really really good job of telling about eighty five percent of my prospective clients not to hire me, not to do this business because they're not going to be successful. Um, they need to have experience in raising assets. They've had to show that they've been able to raise assets or they have an existing distribution channel. When you go out looking for seed capital and you walk into the lead market makers in the AP's office, the first thing they're going to ask you on your little roadshow 
is what's your distribution strategy? Um, and if you don't have one or understand that concept well enough, they're, they're never going to give you the seed capital. Um, so you want to? Yeah, and I and I distribution. Sure, and one thing I I think to kind of follow um, through on this too is uh, a lot of people say, well, every um, ETF model has been um, designed. I mean, there's there's a saturation. We've had every investment style, uh, but because a lot of these ETFs are being seeded by uh, or some by a large institutional investor that that has a unique uh, need. Um, and they're very receptive to an innovative product. Uh, I think you're going to continue the trend to have more and more different types of uh, ETFs, uh, and, and maybe um, there'll be even more uh, than, than mutual funds. So uh, the, I, I don't think there's a saturation point, uh, and I think um, a lot of people or a number of them are launching ETFs not to the broad retail market, uh, but to more uh, to more specific institutional investors that are looking for a product um, that they can get in and out of during the day. Um, and, and one point of clarification too on the management fee, uh, unlike mutual funds, um, ETFs are typically structured as a unified fee. So um, with that management fee, unlike a mutual fund, you, the advisor, are also picking up those that category called other expenses, TA, custody. Uh, so that that's something to, to keep in mind uh, with respect to the uh, the management fee. Um, so yeah, Rich, why don't we move on and and, and tee up uh, distribution? Yeah. So what I'm going to start with on this is uh, uh, Mr. Rowe uh, resubmitted his question, so I have a better understanding of what he was asking. Um, and after this will. The answers to this question will also lead us into some of this discussion. Um, so what Robert was getting at, it says, you are emphasizing the fund expenses as the sole criteria rather than the unique feature of the particular fund's investment focus. Um, it would seem to me that the investment success, uh, success makes us uh, much more difference or certainty uh, than so uh, in the past. Um, and y y that's a valid point, right? If you have a good idea, if you have the right investment idea and you bring it to marketplace, the, uh, that idea, that investment strategy should, should carry to the success of, of the fund. Uh, unfortunately, we don't always see that as the case. We've seen a lot of good products go to the wayside. Um, one is, and we're talking about it later on, you know, how do you get your story out? How do you get to the investors to tell them that this is a good product. Um, how do you get onto these platforms? If you don't have the, the financial wherewithal to keep the fund up and running to you gain assets to be put onto the wirehouse platforms, um, that becomes very difficult for a good idea to get passed on and get to investors. And there's, there's a lot of other things involved uh, in, in making sure that your good idea and your good investment gets to uh, the eyes and ears of the investors. Just putting it on the stock exchange as a fund um, isn't enough, and we've seen a number of ETF providers do that. Right, the old idea of let's throw everything up on the wall and see what sticks, and only the good ones stick. Um, what keeps a fund on the marketplace is the financial wherewithal that why it's growing and gaining um, popularity among the investor class that you have the the cost structure available to keep that fund in the marketplace without having to close down that fund. We see ETF closures all the time uh, because good ideas are lost because the uh, the advisor doesn't have the financial wherewithal to keep that that fund on the marketplace. Uh, or for John and Bibbs, you know, any other thoughts on that? Um, no, I think I mean it, it takes sometimes it takes a fund a while, like any new product, to get adoption in the marketplace, and that's why it, focus on costs early on do matter because you know a leaner product can survive longer in the marketplace. That's basic business, and it's true in the ETF world as well. So you don't want to have where the, uh, uh, the it just takes a while to pick up the adoption. There's a cyclical change in the marketplace, or some other issue happens, and your particular ETF slides out of popularity, out of demand at that moment, and you don't want to be one that can't survive that upheaval in the marketplace until you gain size. So that's why cost matters. It always, it always matters. 
and your, and your track record, that your investment team is doing what you said it was going to do, and a lot of investors watch it for a year, two years, sometimes three years before they, they, they judge that you're meeting your performance criteria, and then they start, they start buying that fund. Uh, we tell clients a lot of times that you're going to need between $500,000 and $750,000 uh, in the bank uh, in order to keep that fund up and running and, and, and cover your cost. And some of the platforms will actually ask you to put that money into an escrow uh, to make sure that all those bills are going to get paid. Because um, like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of people involved in running that ETF and they need to get paid. And if assets aren't coming in, that money's got to get paid from, you know, from somewhere. Um, so one of the ways of doing that and, make, and making sure that, that you can keep those good ideas in the marketplace um, is your distribution process. Um, and like I said earlier, that uh, we're, we're asking clients when they come in, what's your distribution plan? How are you going to do this? Uh, so there are a couple of different ways. Some people have existing wholesalers. And what we see in the ETF space is you have some shops are more mutual fund wholesalers. And they only have a few ETFs. Um, so what they do is they hire an ETF specialist to go around with the mutual fund wholesalers and help them sell the ETF. Uh, other firms will just have a separate ETF wholesaling group um, that will go out. Um, new entrants, there are some third-party distribution people out there, uh, not many, they're hard to find. Uh, you can start to hire one or two salespeople internally if you have the, the, the money. As the fund starts to produce more revenue, you start to hire more wholesalers, you start to grow that out. Um, there's uh, a lot of strategies in use of social media uh, to, to get your story out. Uh, lots of PR firms that can be hired to do that uh, as part of your distribution plan. Um, the other thing when I look at channel competition is understanding your product and who you're selling it to. Um, does, it does the product go across all investors? Is it strictly an institutional product? Is it strictly a retail product? And then you can, you can channel your distribution efforts um, into those specific channels and hire people who understand those specific channels. Um, but, but you see the big shots today are, are all segmenting their wholesales based on channels. Um, and you have to look at your product and understand who you're selling it to so you know how to, who to hire and how to sell that, that product line. Um, and to Robert's uh, point of view and, and his question, right, strategy competition. Right? Is your product better than everybody else's in the marketplace? Are you performing better? Are you a lower cost? Um, you know, where do you fit into the marketplace? You know, do you have some sort of competitive advantage uh, that, that you can put out into the marketplace and tell people that, you know, this is the better product? But you have to have a big microphone uh, between your wholesalers and your PR firm to be able to reach investors so they can hear you and they can see your product. Um, if you broke down the different things that make an ETF successful, and put a percentage on it, I would put distribution at 75% of your success is going to be based on your distribution strategy. Um, it's the single most important factor that you're going to have to look at. And, and there, there's also been some limited cases where an advisor will have a separately managed account business and, uh, and you know this was common in the past where they would roll their SMAs into a mutual fund. In, in a few cases, you've seen that with ETFs. And all of a sudden, you've got a uh, $1 billion ETF provider uh, within a matter of months. Uh, in those cases, it's usually their existing client base. And, um, and, they're, in, and they're hoping um, to build on that by you know, marketing the ETF to broader their strategies to a broader group. But that's, uh, that's one can't miss approach. So I think, um, John, you were going to talk a little bit about uh, branding. Well, I think, yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great move, a step from distribution. So early on, branding was what sold a product and the branding of the index. So if you look at the early success and where a lot of the concentration was, it was with the S&P 500, the Spider, it was with the first products launched by BGI, the Qs, and the NASDAQ 100, the Qs, and the Diamonds. And the index was the beacon that drew investors in. 
Um, that's not so today because one, the product that was they were there were new products back then. They were filling the need that was needed in the marketplace uh, of you know of fish and training baskets of securities. Um, it, it, it was good timing with um, uh, with, with the move to passive and, and so on and so forth. But today, um, investors are less interested, I think, in the brand of the index, and I think what said this very clearly earlier, and much more interested in the brand of the distribution or the ch or the channel or the actual sponsor. So yes, we're not going to. And I mentioned stats earlier. Yeah, there's still a concentration on those large you know, original ETFs and so on, and, and some of the major brands. But today. People want to get the investment thesis they want, but they want to get it from a name or a product line they know. So, you know, iShares offers a whole slew of products, and if they can get a, a similar strategy within a couple of basis points of what somebody else is offering, they're happy to go with a distribution or a channel or something that they know. So I think branding is shifting away from being having the investor uh, be drawn by the index to a lot of other factors. And uh, I think that's to everyone's that, that's to everyone's benefit because then it shifts away from just a broad market index or some, you know, very easy to understand benchmark. It, it opens the door for more fine-tuned strategies or my fine-tuned approaches. So I think we're seeing a major shift in, in branding uh, of what's actually drawing the, uh, the the dollars of the investor. Um, branding, distribution. These things all have to be done in a very proactive basis. You can't sit so I think which is mentioned that as well, is that these things are not um, where you can sit back and you know launch a product and assume that the brand is going to take care of it. It is not. You've got to proactively go out there and push these products through the channels. There's way too much comp uh, uh, other products out there. There's way too much confusion in the marketplace. And uh, so it's your job to differentiate yourselves. It's your job to be proactive about both branding and sale and marketing. Yeah, and I think to illustrate that point, if uh, for ETF insiders, uh, you, you look at what's happening within sort of uh, the employment ranks at some of these large uh, ETF shops. What you're seeing over the last few years is um, the original team that, that brought these products to marketplace, specifically the product managers and the product developers, um, they're starting to be phased out. And they're not being, uh, they're not rehiring in that position. They're rehiring on the distribution side. So there's a, a, a clear move. You can just see within the hiring of these firms, the move away from product development and product idea, and it's a product selling. Um, and the importance of getting into the distribution channel and selling the products that are on the uh, that are on the shelf right now. Um, so the industry has recognized itself too. Uh, the role of distribution in, in building out these funds now. Uh, that are on the marketplace. So that, that's a big trend to, to, to follow and see what's happening in the industry. And, and another way to look at that would be to look from inside the total expenses and see this uh, in the to see from earlier ETFs to more ETFs, the breakdown of expenses, it's not always disclosed, but the breakdown of expenses, and you'll see the what sponsors or paying index providers keeps dropping as a uh, percent of the total expense ratio because basically the service and the brand offered by the index itself is becoming more commoditized and the money is better spent rather than paying the higher money for the index but paying for distribution and, and, and that mechanism in order to grow the ETF. So if you've got the expense ratio and you need it to grow that fund, you got to put the money where it's going to be more important and more important is branding of distribution, marketing, those things than it is uh, branding of the actual index. Okay, so uh, before um, we move to regulatory environment, I'll just remind everybody, if, uh, if they have questions, please submit them, um, and we'd be happy uh, to try to answer them. Um, the regulatory environment, uh, obviously, casting a shadow or, or bringing sunlight, however you want to view it, uh, to the whole regulatory uh, front, uh, you know, will be uh, the new president coming in. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's far too early to speculate, uh, but it's fun to speculate anyway. Uh, one of the things that's uh, interesting is that uh, Paul Atkins, a former commissioner, is leading the, uh, the, secure, the SEC transition team uh, within the president-elect's administration. Um, and I think one thing that would be helpful to the ETF um, community is the fact that he Years ago, he was at PwC and he co-founded their investment management practice. So 
he has a, um, a lot of understanding about uh, the fund industry and the ETF industry and um, you know pure speculation. Uh, we still have um, the non-transparent uh, ETF product that's, that hasn't gotten through the SEC. Um, you know, uh, as well as we have uh, derivative uh, proposals that haven't gotten through. Um, so, um, you know, depending on how these uh, these dominoes fall, uh, it could uh, it could open the floodgates to a lot of new types of ETFs uh, and re and really give a boost to the uh, actively uh, ETF uh, area if uh, one of those exemptive orders gets through. Um, so speaking of the exemptive application process, and you know, going back when you start in this business, there's a couple of uh, significant regulatory hurdles, and just to kind of update uh, people on on those, um, you know, whether you're a um, if you're a pure index uh, ETF or an actively managed transparent uh, ETF, you need relief from the 1940 Act. Um, on those fronts, those that, that relief has been running rather smoothly. Uh, there's not a set timetable, but it's typically been taken five to seven months. Um, but also um, that, that goes along with this relief are various uh, exchange rules. Uh, depending on which exchange you list your ETF on, um, you either need to meet their generic uh, rules um, or you have, or the exchange itself has to apply for rule change, which can be timely. And um, you know, a couple of months ago, well, first of all, when it's a pure index uh, fund, typically you can rely on the exchange's generic listing standards. They're not too problematic uh, with respect to the type of uh, portfolio you can have. Uh, in a few uh, in the constituents characteristics of the underlying portfolio securities etc uh, th those are have not proved to be too uh, insurmountable with most strategies however um, just until the last couple of months um, with respect to an actively managed ETF uh, the each exchange you listed on would have to go to the SEC and get a rule uh, change to, to get uh, that product listed. Uh, the SEC uh, adopted, which I'll talk about um, in a second, a new generic listing standards that, that really parallel the standards that are in place for a passive or index ETF. Uh, so that, that is uh, opened up and, and, and greatly speeded up the whole process of getting a transparent actively ETF to market. Now uh, this next slide you'll see that kind of the holy grail here has still been a, a non-transparent actively managed ETF. This has um, been going on for a number of years. Um, there's a what we're really trying to get the root at, what the industry is trying to get the root at is, is there a substitute for disclosing the entire uh, portfolio every morning. Um, and, and obviously when you do that, somebody can uh, figure out and re-engineer your uh, strategy pretty quickly. And that's kept a lot of, uh, of the large mutual fund shops on the sidelines in the ETF world. Uh, so far, um, none of these substitutes um, um, that have been uh, suggested or applied for by various uh, large institutions uh, have alleviated the, the SEC's concern here. Uh, so um, the, this slide just kind of lists out um, the various uh, applicants. Now, again, um, that may change. Uh, there may be a more uh, a, a new administration that comes in and has the ability to, to appoint not only new chairman but, but people at SES levels within the SEC. There may be a new attitude uh, toward these products. Um, and if so, that, that will lead to probably a flood of, of actively managed ETFs. But that's, uh, we've got to wait on that to see if that actually happens. I mentioned uh, this slide, I won't repeat myself, but again, kind of the, the 
the big news over the uh, SEC recently, at least with respect to the SEC uh, in, in ETFs, is this um, generic listing standards, and, and you should see your actively uh, managed uh, ETFs going through that process a lot faster. Now, um, as far as comments, um, uh, this is what I'm talking about when you launch a new ETF or uh, occasionally when you're uh, filing a post-effective amendment to your registration statement. Um, the, there's a couple of themes um, that permeate through disclosure and also rulemaking. Um, the SEC is uh, still very interested uh, when an ETF, its advisor is using an affiliated um, index provider and, and they're very interested in the methodology. So, um, in 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 a lot of this has come up in uh, these beta or smart beta ETFs, and the SEC, um, you know, like everybody, is wondering how um, is there, um, how close is this to an, an e, really an index fund, or you know, is it a type of methodology that somehow could be front run it or somebody take advantage of it? Um, and, and so you see, you continue to see questions a lot, especially with um, with new products like that. And the other thing I'll mention, and, and came up in in the recently uh, adopted liquidity rule, um, the SEC asks a lot of questions about how much of a cash component um, is in a, a redemption uh, or a purchase. Uh, because it sees that cash having uh, to be used to go out and buy the portfolio securities or, or sell them, and that creating transaction costs for the shareholders. Uh, so you see a lot of attention there. Um, now, um, John, I'll, I'll just flip it to you um, with respect to, you know, obviously August 24th is the date, um, kind of like December 7th in, uh, for Pearl Harbor uh, in the ETF industry, and, um, and, and there were reports and studies and what happened on that day. Is there any um, new developments uh, with respect to uh, kind of market structure in, in August 24th? Yeah, I think, but I think there's one question that popped in before we move on. Oh, yeah, sure. Two questions. Uh, yeah, a couple questions. One was about uh, Eaton Vance product called next shares and um, in, in, in I just want to distinguish uh, that product which is uh, a wonderful product is, is technically not an exchange traded fund and I, and I won't use up too much time of trying to explain that so it, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's a great product but it's not the panacea to transparency uh, because it's a kind of a hybrid between a mutual fund and an, and an ETF. Um, and yes, but it, it, it is an alternative out there, um, but it, it's not a product that's kind of opened up the floodgates uh, for a lot of mutual fund providers to, to jump into the ETF space. Although I do see that there's been many that have taken a license, and I think they're going under the handle Exchange Trade Mutual Fund uh, to kind of bridge the gap, as you point out. Right. And then I have one uh, housekeeping question that somebody joined late. Um, they asked whether they can catch up. They missed the first 40 minutes. I will I won't give their name uh, like Rich gave a name earlier, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it, we will have this archive, so it should be on our website shortly. And um, if you're not able to find it, uh, email Elise, and we can make sure uh, you can receive that. Or we can start over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, uh, getting back to the regulatory environment, so I think you know, good did a great job talking about all the work the SEC is doing right now and is faced with as they try to handle the plethora of new products and new product designs and really continue trying to move this industry forward. Um, on the other side, there's another whole track that I think both the SEC and the exchanges are very involved with, which is things like what happened on August 24th, the flash crash of 2010, the issue with uh, BNY and SunGuard with the uh, NAVs on a lot of those products. So um, I think the, in, in taking in whole, I think there's been a there's a tremendous focus at both the exchanges and at the regulators and policymakers on ensuring the stability and the structural issues around exchange traded funds and, and all their flavors. Uh, the entire infrastructure from some soup to nuts. Um, these are all examples of it. I know the NYC was very proactive in hiring McKinsey and Company to come in and do some more infrastructure. 
studies. I know NASDAQ and, and BATS have been extremely involved in making sure that they're trying to nuance the market, et cetera, and working with the, the SEC to do that. Because remember, these products are still relatively new compared to equities, which have been around for an awful long time, and that one size doesn't fit all. At the same time that the ETFs have exploded onto the marketplace, you've seen massive changes in the exchanges in the U.S. where the focus has been on speed and the focus has been on technology and um, a lot of other changes to the, to the, to the market structure. So, Again, I, 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 everyone realizes that, that we can't afford those, these kinds of events, and I think that uh, uh, the exchanges and the, uh, the, um, the markets are very, along with the SEC, are very focused on this issue. Uh, I think it's, uh, I, I, can't, I can't imagine there's anything else more top of mind to them right now uh, that they're looking at. So, Yeah, I, I think uh, there is, I think, I believe one thing that has been done so far in terms of uh, the, the situation from August 24th. Uh, one of the issues you have with ETFs is uh, you can have an ETF listed on NASDAQ, but the majority of the components of that ETF are listed on other exchanges, such as the NYSC. Uh, and what the exchanges have done in the interim with that issue is they're coordinating their reopening of halted stocks. So the exchanges now around the, the halting and, and reopening of stocks are communicating with each other. So that's a more uniform process. And that will alleviate a lot of the problems that happened that day when some stocks were open and some stocks weren't, and nobody knew what the actual price of the basket was because only certain stocks in that basket were trading and others weren't. Yeah. So that coordinated event between the exchanges is a first real step in those exchanges understanding our marketplace and adopting new rules to, uh, to help it. Yeah, I think Rich is absolutely uh, quick to point that out because although exchanges are extremely competitive, in this issue they're not. This is not about a competition. This is about... A problem on one market doesn't help any market. So I think this is a perfect example of how you know cooperation is going to lead to a better outcome for everyone. Yeah, and I'm, I'll put in a plug uh, for or John, what he, he's doing now uh, at the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy. They've uh, been putting on a wonderful series of, of seminars, and a lot of the discussion is really interesting. You know, there, there's just questions about exchanges and the markets and how they're working um, and you know you realize ETFs are kind of an overlay and uh, so if you, if you get a chance try to get on those mailing lists uh, it's a neutral forum and a lot in, in its involvement with the SEC um, market exchanges everybody kind of batting around these ideas and um, so a lot of issues maybe just down at the um, at the basic functioning of an exchange and they percolate up to the ETF. That's, I think, the interesting dynamic is between the two. So, well, we just have a couple more minutes, so I'm just going to um, just sum up kind of some of these last few slides. Uh, there, there was a liquidity rule recently adopted by the SEC. Um, you don't have to worry about it until 2018, so um, I won't <laughs> I don't want to have to spend too much time on it, but it did touch on uh, ETFs, and I think it's worth reading the release, especially uh, about um, how uh, the, the ETFs didn't escape the liquidity rule, and in certain circumstances, they have to uh, um, to uh, monitor the liquidity of the underlying portfolio security. Uh, the next rule, the kind of a, another rule that came out at the same time, the SEC collects uh, information from mutual funds and ETFs, and they're overhauling that entire process. And they have very uh, specific information that ETFs are going to have to provide. Um, and again, that's not going to be effective, or, or the compliance state's not until 2018. Um, I, you can read the slide about kind of what the SEC's inspection uh, branch has been focusing on. And then the, the last couple of slides, um, you know, we talked about distribution, and then if you have captive assets, um, nobody's still been able to get through the SEC converting a regular mutual fund into an ETF. Um, again, this may be one of those things that um, there may be a, a, an environment more receptive to this. Who knows? Um, however, uh, closed-end funds, a number have been converted to ETFs, um, and it's possible, I think, um, you'll also see 
closed in funds launched with um, a, a conversion kind of baked in at a certain point in time to address the discount factor. So there, there's still a lot of um, uh, innovation. And then um, really only got about a minute, but our, our last slide was kind of why launch now. Maybe we've already answered that. I'm not sure. Do you have any uh, thoughts? Richard. Yeah, I think that's a good way of summarizing the, the, the presentation by going through that just, just real quickly. Um, so from my point of view, and, and there's a lots of reasons uh, why to launch now, and there's, we were at an ETF conference earlier this week. Uh, I'll throw out one quick stat, which will kind of sum up why you should continue to launch ETFs. 12% um, of the households in the U.S. now own an ETF. Put that in perspective of the mutual fund industry, that would bring us back to somewhere in the early 1980s. Um, so if you look at the ETF industry today is what the mutual fund industry was in the 1980s, there's a lot of room for growth. Uh, there's a lot of room for a variety of developments, especially within the divine contribution space, which is what drove the mutual fund growth. Uh, that hits the ETF space, huge amount of growth opportunities around that. Um, so yes, there are lots of reasons to launch an ETF and launch an ETF now. Uh, it's still early in the game, uh, and to use an old expression, you know, the water's fine, guys. Jump on in. <clears throat> well, I want to thank uh, Rich and John, and thank uh, the audience for participating. And again, if you have any uh, questions, um, you know, we have an email address on the presentation. <laughs>